Campbell Carter. I am a member of church here at Friendship Baptist, and I am so thankful that we can host this activity for the community. Uh, the Office of Sustainability and Danielle have really just been a blessing to us, and so we're looking forward to continuing this. Today, our speaker is, say your name again. Sajo Abdallah. Sajo. If you forget, Ab it's like you saw someone named Joe. It's usually what I tell people. Okay. That's good to eat. That's <laughs> Sajo. Sajo. And so Sajo is going to be presenting our benefits of native plants in the city. If you have any questions, ask her, not me. And we will make sure you get the correct answer. We also appreciate Devin. He's going to be videotaping for our um, activity. And the activity will be on the City of Columbia page so that anybody who did not participate will have the opportunity to learn. Any, yes, thank you for raising your hand. We're, we're, we're gonna send those to you on your email and that will happen. Mm -hmm. Any other? It was difficult to get everything done, you know, and try to figure out what, so we're, we're slowly but surely getting into the swing of things. Remember, this is our second of um, four series of the series, so we still have lots to do, and it's working. It's going very well. Any other questions, comments? I'm Dee, in case you need anything, and Sajo. 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 Yes. I'll say it again, too. I'll introduce myself as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Dee. Uh, hi everyone, welcome. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to see all of your faces. I know the weather was kind of dreary this morning, so it's nice that it kind of got a little better. I see the sun coming out. Um, like you mentioned, I am Sajo Abdallah. I'm a private lands biologist. I work for the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, my current role kind of lets me do a lot of community engagement, kind of like today. Um, I also work on consultations for Como Wild Yards, if anybody knows. If not, and you want to learn more, catch me after the presentation. I would love to tell you. Um, but today we'll be talking about benefits of native plants in the city. Um, so let's start. So just a little agenda so everybody knows where we're at. Uh, I'll be talking about a few different things. Firstly, uh, how it's a resource for wildlife. Um, then how they improve air quality, how they can prevent water runoff, how they can reduce heat. Uh, and I named this section, Save Money and Look Great Doing It. <laughs> Basically, just talking about how native plants are beautiful and they can also save the city and you money in the long run. Uh, and then we're going to go into some green infrastructure as well. So let's start. Uh, so first and foremost, as a lot of you know, I'm sure you're gardeners and, and you're super into this stuff, uh, it's a resource for wildlife. So native plants can provide food, um, habitat, shelter for some of these wildlife species, especially pollinators. Um, I think Danielle actually might have mentioned it during her presentation, um, but monarch butterflies and milkweed go hand in hand. So adult monarchs, they lay their eggs on milkweed, and then the caterpillars only eat milkweed. Um, so no milkweed, no monarchs, kind of vice versa. Um, and a lot of the killers for these species is habitat fragmentation. So when we cut down trees, cut down habitat to make, you know, industrialized places, um, developed areas, buildings, stores, um, good for us, sure, but it is harmful to pollinators. Oh, I see a hand. <laughs> oh, is that better? <laughs> Sorry. Sometimes I don't forget. Um, so yes. Um, so planting native species helps ensure their survival. Um, and also because pollinators, um, they pollinate, I believe it's one third of every bite of food. Um, our species and our, our survival also depends on them as well. Um, and the cool thing about native plants is that every part can be used by wildlife. So you can see here in the slide, the flowers themselves can be used by pollinators. Um, the fruits can be used by birds and mammals, and then the leaves can be eaten by caterpillars. So native plants are amazing. They're a fantastic resource for wildlife. Uh, and this slide, <laughs> the faces behind pollination. Really, this was just supposed to be a reminder of sorts for us on why planting native species is so helpful, the species that we would be helping. Um, and really just doing something as simple as planting a native flower can help so many of these at-risk species. So we have things like bumblebees, um, and the cool thing about them is that they actually see in ultraviolet. So blue flowers really just go a long way at attracting them. So Things like blue labellia, um, tall larkspur. Those are really some amazing species for butterflies. Some easy ones that you can plant in your own yard to get them over to you. 
Um, same with monarch butterflies. Planting milkweed really, really goes a long way. They have to pass through here for their migration. So planting some milkweed will go a long way at ensuring that they can get to their destination and have what they need. Um, and hummingbirds. Actually, when I'm driving around the neighborhood, I see a lot of the hummingbird feeders, so I'm sure I have some fans of hummingbirds here in the audience. Um, but they love, love, love red flowers. So any bright red flower, um, maybe like red columbine, I think fire pink also is a good one for them. They love it, it attracts them, and again, it's just really a reminder that planting a simple flower goes a long, long way. Uh, another benefit is the improved air quality. Um, so plants in general um, will help with carbon emissions, but native plants are kind of special in that they have a very extensive network um, beneath the surface that we don't even see. So you can kind of see in these pictures, um, our native plants have longer roots than some of their non-native counterparts. Um, I know I see daylilies a lot in this area. Beautiful, beautiful flowers, but you can just see, I mean, even in the roots, they just, they don't have the system that these native plants do. Um, so these native plants can remove carbon from the air and they can store it within these extensive root systems. Sure, sure, sure. Is it kind of hard to read? So, so I believe right here we have Aspiria. Um, right next to it in the orange we have daylilies. Like I said, I've seen this one a lot actually here in Missouri and in Columbia. Um, and then this one is perennial fountain grass right next to it. Um, and right next to that one is fescue grass. Um, if you look over at the native side, you have buffalo grass, you have prairie drop seed, black-eyed Susan, which I've seen a lot here, so I know it's a really popular one, um, and then common nine bark, which you can see has the longest and most extensive roots of all of these plants. Common nine bark, like the number nine, nine bark. So it's amazing what we don't see under the surface, right? Like you might see a plant and even if it looks smaller, I mean, a very extensive root systems, it's, it's crazy. Um, but again, these can store a lot more carbon than their non-native counterparts because of these root systems. Um, native plants have evolved over thousands of years to live in this specific environment. They're used to the soil, they're used to the insects. Um, so that really just makes them a lot hardier and in need of less maintenance like our non-native counterparts, um, which means there's less mowing. And if there's less mowing, you have less carbon emissions being released into the air. Um, so, and this is especially important when we're talking about things like cities, um, because of the increased carbon emissions within the city, there's less vegetation, more buildings, more streets. So this is really important, especially. Uh, next, we have water runoff prevention. So again, these root systems, just like they help with carbon emissions, they also help with collecting some of this excess storm water um, that normally would just run rampant. Um, these plants will just help put it into the ground. Um, they help with erosion prevention. They help filter this excess storm water. Um, and even structures like bioswales and rain gardens, um, they will store that excess water and direct it downward to be used later on. Um, so really amazing. That means less water runoff, less pollutants getting into our water, which means healthier water, and by extension, healthier people as well. Uh, another very, very big one, um, especially when we're talking about cities. So cities get hot. <laughs> You've seen in the summer, I mean, even just being here these last couple months, it gets hot. Um, so we do have campaigns here in Columbia to address it, but before I go into that, I did want to talk about the urban heat island effect. Basically, simple is just cities um, and more urbanized areas tend to be hotter on average than rural and suburban areas that have a little bit more vegetation, um, more open areas. Um, so if you look at the picture right here, this one, you can see materials that are darker in color, such as buildings, they will absorb and retain the energy from the sun. Um, and even after the sun has gone down, they still have that energy stored and they're still releasing it. So even at night, it's still hotter than uh, an area with less uh, buildings, more vegetation. Um, so again, cities just tend to have more of this. I mean, just by the nature of being a city, there's more buildings, more roads, more streets. Um, the lack of vegetation also um, increases the temperature. So when you don't have things like trees um, and flowers and, and grasses, you don't have those plants that normally would be there cooling the air, they're, they're just not there. Um, and of course, when you're talking about dense places like cities, um, that lack of open space just sort of creates a pocket that doesn't really let the air flow as it normally would in let's say like a woodland area, a forest. Um, it's just basically a dense pocket of still air. 
Um, so you can really see why when you don't have the, the native plants, the vegetation, it will just drive up temperatures in cities. So again, we do have a campaign to address this. Some of you might know it. It's the Show Me the Heat campaign. Um, this is all through the city. I can't take any credit for this. I don't know where Danielle is, but that's Danielle's bag. <laughs> um, so this campaign, really cool. Volunteers actually were the ones that collected all the data. So they drove around in their cars with sensors attached on the same day, just different times throughout the day. I, I want to say it's morning, afternoon, and evening. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but they drove around in their own vehicles, they collected this data, uh, and then that data was then created, or used to create this heat map that you can see right here. And this is our city, this is, this is Como. Um, so if you take a look at the bottom, these were the routes that were created by the volunteers. These were the routes that they followed. Um, so what did their data show? Kind of what we talked about before. If you take a look in the darker red, you can see those pockets of the dense heat. Those are heat islands. Um, so in the middle right here, the first word, yes, so that's near Mizzou. Um, so you can sort of see those dense pockets where the heat is. Um, so basically the data just showed that those more developed areas, more industrialized areas, more buildings, less vegetation, were hotter on average, no matter the time of day. Yeah, sure, jump on in. <laughs> So I'll just point out here. So here's the business loop right up here above the first ward. Mizzou is down here. Um, Stevens Lake is around here, I think, if I got it right. Yeah, it's up here somewhere. Um, so it's, it's very distinct. And if you follow, I think you're going to talk about it in a minute, but our streams and stuff, you can see the difference that they make. So yeah, j just like Danielle mentioned, uh, you can see the pockets in the red of where the heat was the most abundant, and then in the yellow, you can see where it was a little bit less developed, more vegetation. The cool thing about it is that not only were those areas cooler on average, they also helped cool the surrounding area. So even in the map, you can see it goes from yellow to orange and then to red, so it's a gradual increase. So those plants are actually helping cool the surrounding area. So plants make a difference, really, they do. <laughs> uh, and then again, just another map. Um, if anybody's been to the Conley Shopping Center here in Columbia, same thing. Sort of here on the left, you can see that the creek runs kind of in front of it. Um, it's marked as a floodplain. Um, and if you take a look in the middle, again, it just mentions that the shopping center itself is a high-intensity developed area as compared to the creek, where you can see that it's in that lighter green, which is deciduous forest and then the yellow, which is pasture hay. Um, what does this all mean? <laughs> kind of what we talked about before. Take a look at the heat map. While the shopping center itself is the hottest one, it's you know dark red, highest temperature, the creek itself is yellow, so showing that it is a lot cooler. Um, and again, gradual increase in temperature, so it's actually helping cool the surrounding area. Um, so just a really neat example here within our city that just show the, the importance of native plants. Oh, so on to my favorite portion, <laughs> save money and look great doing it. So of course, native plants are beautiful. They add aesthetic value to properties, to cities, to buildings. Um, they look great, but like I mentioned, they do end up saving the city and by extension, you money in the process. Um, they are adapted to this environment. They don't need as much maintenance, so they don't need things like fertilizers. They don't need to be watered as much. Um, so using less water, less water bill. Um, reduced need for fertilizers also reduces money in that regard as well. Uh, and the cool thing about it is that they can be tailored to your likes, or if it's like for a building in the city, it can be tailored to that building and the, the management's likes. So even myself, like I mentioned before, uh, I do consultations for Como Wild Yards, um, and some people have very specific looks. So they like bright, beautiful flowers. Other people, not so much, and that's okay, because there's a native plant for everybody, so. <laughs> So you might love the really bright, beautiful, in-your-face flowers, right? We have purple coneflower, we have black-eyed Susan, uh, royal catchfly, those really bright, vibrant wildflowers. Again, some people don't like that, and that's okay because we do have plants for them as well. We have big blue stem, alum root, buffalo grass. So it really goes to show that these can be tailored to your lifestyle, your likes, um, buildings, kind of what works best for that building and that management. Um, so it's really amazing. There's always a plant for somebody. 
So now that we've sort of talked about some of the benefits that these native plants can provide within cityscapes, I did want to show you them at work. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about green infrastructure. Um, but I did want to show you a video that kind of goes into it as well. Um, this one is filmed in New York City, but a lot of the stuff that they talk about, like rain gardens, um, it does work for us as well here in Colombia and, and other states and other cities. So sustainability is about utilizing resources wisely now so that they're available for future generations to use. In, in developing green infrastructure around stormwater, what we're trying to do is to preserve water quality into the future for New Yorkers. So this is an example of green infrastructure. And green infrastructure is defined as using our plants, soils, and natural environment to try to mitigate the impacts of the development that we see behind us. Here, this is a new LEED certified building that was built on the Hofstra University campus on Long Island. And in doing so, the designers built this low area to collect stormwater running off of that, that parking lot and storing it here. By putting the water here, we're preventing the pollution and excess water from entering the surface water bodies that surround Long Island. Porous pavement is one type of green infrastructure, and porous pavement essentially is a hard surface that has the ability to absorb water. When you put water on top of a porous pavement, you still have the hard structure of pavement, but the water goes down through it as opposed to sliding over it. And by retaining that water going down as opposed to over the top, you can hold pollutants back, you can hold sediments back, and you can provide for better water quality protection at the end of the line. Uh, rain garden is a shallow bowl that we direct water to on purpose. Rain gardens mimic nature, so what we try to do is we have a spot for water to be collected and then we let that water soak back into the groundwater. If the water soaks in a day or less, it's a rain garden. If the water sits there longer than a day, it's not a rain garden. It's a swamp, a bog, or something else. So then we then plant that rain garden with uh, deep-rooted plants. The plants take up that water, soak up that water, use that water, and, uh, and clean that water almost drinkable standards within two to three feet underneath that soil. Most people think that a rain garden is a wet spot so you want wet plants. It's actually the opposite. You actually want dry plants that can handle some water not wet plants that can handle drought. The rain garden is only wet when it rains so it's only wet a small percentage of the time. You want more dry plants that can handle uh, water. Hydrangeas do make a good rain garden plant uh, as well as uh, black-eyed Susans and purple cone flowers number of uh, trees and shrubs. You can put rain gardens in shade so that hydrangea for the shade but also hostas and uh, ferns and things like that work well in the shade so you can go in either direction. Where you place a rain garden is where is the water flow across your property. The downspout off your house, the sump pump outlet, off the edge of the driveway where the water flows across the grass, those are all good opportunities uh, to capture that water. So this is a rain garden with the town of Oyster Bay. It's newly planted so the plants are still growing, there's still some room to grow. How this rain garden works is that we're taking water off of the roadway here and it falls into this basin where I'm sitting. When the garden uh, starts to fill up with water, the water will soak into the ground and get clean and cool and go to the sound which is uh, uh, further in the distance. When we get too much rain, when we have too much water in a big storm event, the water goes over the dam and then down the drain and over my right shoulder here. So again, you could see there they were talking about rain gardens. Again, it was filmed in New York, but that could still be applied to us here in Como. Um, all of us could still have rain gardens uh, within our cities and even in our homes. Um, so I did want to talk about a few other green infrastructure that we could um, see in cities. So again, we have things like rain gardens, but there are wetlands, there are road verges, there are bioswales, um, green roofs, and also green walls. There's many, many more, but I just want to focus on these for today, just a few examples that I've seen. Um, so here is actually an example of a rain garden within our city. Um, so this one is actually near the creek that I talked about before, Hinkson Creek. Um, it filters the storm water before it even enters the creek. So again, if anybody has been to that area or, or knows that area, maybe lives by that area, um, just a really nice example within our city limits. 
You can see things like cone flowers, um, which are the really pretty purple ones there. You can see blazing star, which are those longer, brightly colored ones sort of in the middle of the picture. Um, so really great native plants that we have. There are also things like wetlands. Um, so these guys are just areas um, where the water sort of covers the soil. They are different from other bodies of water, let's say ponds, um, and being that they're a little bit more terrestrial. So they have a little bit more soil and land showing. Uh, and this makes them really great because they can cater to a lot of different species, not only on land, terrestrial, but also aquatic. So it makes them very, very versatile. Um, we can have them within the city limits. Um, I know myself in, in our office, we do try to focus a lot on wetland creation. Um, so this is really, really nice. Um, and they also absorb pollutants. Um, they absorb excess nutrients, um, even sediments before they even reach other bodies of water. Um, so they really do serve an essential fun function within the ecosystem. Um, and they also act as water filters and, again, provide food, shelter for habitat, uh, filtering, erosion control. So wetlands are probably one of the most essential uh, habitats that we can, we can build. Uh, another thing that I've seen uh, are actually road verges, and you might have also seen yourself. Um, so these are just vegetated strips that are kind of uh, along roads between more developed areas. Generally, they consist of things like woodlands, um, shrubs. I've seen wildflowers as well. Um, but these can really just be hot spots for pollinators, um, and they can act as corridors as well for these pollinators. So think if you're a butterfly and you're trying to fly and there's a big road in the middle with a bunch of cars going super fast, you need a little help. <laughs> you need something to, to hold on to, like a habitat of some kind. So road verges are really, really essential and super helpful to these pollinators. Uh, kind of like I mentioned before, we do have things like bioswales. Um, bioswales are essentially just long um, trenches, usually covered with vegetation and things like soil, mulch, stones. Um, and these can help slow down rainwater and also filter out these pollutants. Um, they're a little bit different than rain gardens like we mentioned before. So these guys, um, they sort of direct stormwater away through curved, like essentially trenches and paths, um, whereas a rain garden would take that excess rainwater and store it down into the ground. So a little different, um, but definitely sort of a similar premise. You can see here it's planted, beautiful vegetation, um, but those stones and that sort of curved path is really what helps direct that storm water away. Uh, another one that I haven't seen here in Colombia, but I've heard they're gaining popularity in other places, um, green roofs. So kind of what they, what they sound like. These are just roofs that have been planted with vegetation. Um, they provide more habitat for pollinators. They provide shelter, food. Um, it gives kind of the dual benefit of providing that habitat while also assisting uh, the people in the building and the building itself. So plants on top will help cool the building, um, lowering like air bills, AC bills, things like that of that nature. Um, and it does reduce the heat island effect as well, like we talked about before. Oh, I see a question. So I don't know construction wise, from maybe Danielle, you know a little bit more about that, but I've seen it kind of. Uh, so plants selected for green roofs, we would choose things that don't have super deep root systems and be more fibrous and spread out. So we have a myriad of species that have all sorts of root systems in native plants because they've adapted and co-evolved with each other. And so they've learned how to find those nutrients living next door to each other. I see another hand. Uh, a good example of the green here in Columbia. Uh, the university has several. When we built the new Ellis Shaw, right. they have three roofs. Um, Missouri Orchard PD Institute, if you go up on a higher floor, you can see a close house. Right. Repeat the question. Repeat the question. Oh, it, she was just sharing that. At, you said the university, right? There's, there's a roof basically there with also plants and things, kind of like we're talking about here. Um, Thank you for sharing, great example. <laughs> um, but again, reduces the heat island effect, um, helps cool the building, also helps absorb those pollutants that are in the air. So people working around that area, maybe walking, living around that area, they also have healthier, cleaner air, so. And then sort of in the same general idea, same general premise, we have green walls. 
Same idea as green roofs, only they grow vertically while green roofs grow on top horizontally. Um, they add an extra layer of insulation to buildings. They cool them. Um, again, they can absorb the pollutants in the air um, and again, improve air quality. So very, very similar, just sort of on different parts of buildings. So those would be mostly vines? Yes, those could be vines. Those could be kind of planted upward. Basically plants without, how Danielle mentioned, um, without those super, super deep roots or maybe roots that go out this way instead. Um, I don't think, do we have any in the city here? of green walls? Not constructed like that, be more vines. Like this one, mm -hmm. um, you know, there are certain bricks that you can set up in a position that allows you to put soil in it. And we have a lot of cliff loving species that you could plant in there. Um, so I would, I think that's what this one is. Um, examples around town would be more of a growing a vine up the right. wall to shade it and things like that. So now that we've sort of talked about some of these green infrastructures, um, I know you shared yours. Uh, I wanted to see if everyone could just take maybe five to 10 minutes, share with the people around you. Um, have you seen maybe other examples of green infrastructure? Maybe not here in Como, maybe other places you've lived, visited, um, maybe how you've seen native plants implemented in other ways within our cities um, or suburban areas. So we'll take five minutes and if the conversation's flowing, we might extend it. <laughs> I heard a lot of good discussion. Hopefully there's some people that would like to share maybe what they talked about with someone around them. Um, I believe we have a talking shovel. I don't know where D is. <laughs> I heard an oh no. <laughs> so if D will come back, if anybody wants to share, we would love to hear some, some feedback and yeah. Right now, if anybody would like to share right now. Does anybody have something they talked about? Sure thing, here I'll give you the mic. And the shovel, perfect timing. <laughs> shovel and mic. Um, we just kind of talked about, or I shared with my uh, neighbors here, that at Gentry, our seventh grade um, science teachers have done a great job of taking some of the locations where trailers had been sitting at one time and converting them into garden beds and actually have the kids doing a lot of the work. I mean, it's a much smaller scale than what you're talking about here, but it's really cool. Which then also thinking about the green roofs, I don't know that our seventh grade science teachers know that MOI and Ellis Fischel have those. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that part of their curriculum is talking about um, heat islands. So I'm gonna share that with our science teachers and see what they can Yeah, absolutely. Going. Thank you so much for sharing. Anybody else? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dee. <laughs> yeah. Hi, on my uh, ride in with the friends that I came with for the lecture on Smiley Lane, I think there's a bank. I can't, where am I oriented? Where's the front of the church? So it would be down there with a massive installment of Prairie Dock in bloom, and it looks phenomenal. It's just, wow. That's all. Great. Thank you for so sharing. The corner of yeah. Smiley and Huge. Range yeah. Line. Is it on? Okay, I just wanted to let everybody know that if you're driving north on Providence and you go past Vandiver, then you go up to Blue Ridge, and from Blue Ridge all the way up to Smiley, where Providence ends, on the right, there's a huge strip that they're developing, right? What is it called? Roadside, Roadside Pollinator Program. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. So um, just have a question about if you drive west and south from High V, on the west High V, and you drive south towards like Daniel Boone Little League baseball field. Scott. Yeah, Scott. I'm sorry, yes. 
there's a pollinator habitat that's right in the median of the road. And that just seems like a bad spot to me. You know, any, any pollinator's gotta go through two lanes of traffic to get anywhere. So can you just comment on that? Yeah, for sure. And and so the research, I've looked into like the primary literature um, and it's it's really inconclusive. So some studies have found that, yeah, it definitely has an effect. Others have found no effect, uh, you know, mortality rate related to cars. And so I went to Fish and Wildlife Service and asked the endangered species biologist what he thought. And he said, any habitat is good. So, yeah, do it. I was just noticing that there's lots of corporations and, you know, Boone Hospital and things like that that do some phenomenal landscaping. Um, I'm not sure that they're totally native, but they are definitely trying to add more green space to Columbia. Um, what I was wondering are some of those um, organizations that you highlighted last time, would they be able to help individuals develop private land? Are there grants or any programs for private individuals? Because it can be rather expensive to take on yeah. something. Um, I, I personally know that Boone Electric and the Department of Conservation has worked with me to uh, kind of restore the electrical easement on my property to be a wildlife meadow kind of situation. They, with you as well. they provided, they bought the seed for me, I think, and I had to provide the uh, manpower and we had to use a lot of, of herbicide to uh, start it off. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm not crazy about that, but I'm just wondering what kind of agencies might, I mean, you know, like I'm sure that these other companies either have grants or tax breaks how or something. I saw an article in the Missouri Conservationist about somebody in another part of Missouri who did it. And um, I called them. <laughs> so <laughs> as far as private lands, uh, that's actually the office that I work out of with the Fish and Wildlife Service. So that's kind of our, our jam. Um, we, I guess on large scale properties, we provide a lot of cost sharing opportunities. Um, so my coworkers who are also biologists, they typically cover that side of things. Maybe going to more rural, larger landscapes. Um, but when you're within the city limits, smaller properties like houses, we do have the Como Wild Yards program that Danielle actually gave to the Fish and Wildlife Service um, where we would go and consult with you, go to your house, talk about your conservation goals, things of that nature, and then provide you with a recommendation plan as well as like resources, like site prep information, um, everything you would need basically to get started. So if you want, come find me at the end. I have cards. And anybody else, that goes for anyone else. Yeah, and I would just add to that that as of this year, so Sajo's position is brand new at Fish and Wildlife Service, and we've just recently partnered, it's going through council right now, our organizations have come together to administer the Como Wild Yards program, and now money is attached to that. So we have a small uh, chunk of money to help homeowners plant gardens. So we will purchase plant material for your garden when you go through the program, you get a plan and all that stuff. I'm uh, having this program at my house, even as we speak. Um, it's so intense. I mean, they tell you exactly what to do, step by step. Um, one of the uh, conservationists has been out and helped me look at the property and uh, tell me where, you no, know, he doesn't really tell you where to plant, he just said, I, I knew kind of what I wanted, and I put out a test plot a couple of years back, so I knew what not to do, uh, but he's been out, and they will also come out and do a controlled burn, 
at the right time of the year to get rid of that thatch that the herbicide kills. So it's an extensive it's an extensive program. They they do offer cost sharing, and by you know December, I'm going to have over an acre of more wallflowers. So I'm excited. Yeah, so I think you're talking about Missouri Department of Conservation. So they, too, have a private lands division. And if you're out in the county and more rural lands, that's the kind of support that they provide. Uh, Como Wild Yards is more geared towards the native landscape. Let's create a garden in front of your house. So we don't, we don't necessarily support prescribed burns or things like that, but we will help you create a plan and buy the plant materials. Yeah, just going back to the original prompt, um, one thing we were talking about was sort of the like architectural and logistical difficulties of green roofs. And I mentioned I was at the University of Minnesota and they were trying to figure out how to do this at their library. And in the end, what they ended up doing was they took some raised beds and they put them underneath their air conditioner units where they were dripping water. And it created these beautiful plants and they were just shallow stuff that were fine in the containers. And it was just a really simple, beautiful, solution <laughs> to Fantastic. what they wanted to just get more greenery in that area. Um, I was also going to say, if you guys haven't been on the Hickson Creek behind the Emu Mule Barn and the neighborhoods up on Old 63, there's a beautiful prairie type landscape restoration back there and the Black Eyed Susans are gorgeous right now. So that's a really awesome. nice uh, walk if you're looking for one to take where the somebody, I don't know who, has done a lot of work to make that landscape <laughs> really beautiful. Yeah, so you're talking about the new Hinkson Trail portion. That's um, the, it's our wild night nature organization. So they actually own the land and when the city came through and built the trail, I, we worked with them to help restore that area and they are the ones leading it and stewarding it. And, and so Nadia, who will be talking, giving a presentation on wild edible, she's very much a part of that program. Um, and they've been planting micro forests and things like that. So they're always looking for volunteers. If you're interested, it's called It's Our Wild Nature. It's Our, our Wild, wild Nature. nature. <laughs> we have one more comment. Do either of you ladies have information on what the current level of CO2 is in the atmosphere? And at what level of CO2 does plant life start to die? Really great question. Yeah, ours is more. <laughs> yeah. We'll, See, we'll have to <laughs> we'll have to get back to you on that well, one. Yeah. You can go to climatedepot.com. And what was reported on Eagle 93 on a, a question about similar thing, that the current level, I don't know if it was in the United States or who took it, but the current level was 0.04% CO2. And the level at which plant life dies is 0.02. Yeah, so, and <clears throat> when my grandson came home with some uh, climate change stuff, <clears throat> I explained to him that all the plants he saw around him were absorbing CO2 and putting oxygen back in the land. So if we are any more detrimental to the CO2 level, we aren't gonna have plants. Right. That's why we're doing what we're doing, y'all. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, Dee. And what was that website that you said again? Climate Depot. Like Home Depot. Okay, Climate Depot. It's a good one. Dot com. Thank Climate you so much for Depot. sharing. I think, I think that's everybody, unless anyone had anything else to add. Oh. Um, in the last, well, a few years ago, uh, Los Angeles, it was hot. So they painted some of their streets white. And it really huh. brought the temperature down. Well, a Yahoo.com homepage the last few days, there's a, a fellow who's come up with the whitest white in the world, color paint. And so consider painting roofs and, and roads white with the, that man's paint. Yeah, that's a really great example of green infrastructure as well. Thank you for sharing. We also had an example of someone putting up a mirror in their garden to add light. 
So just like you, it works in your house, it will work in your garden right. if you need extra light. Yeah, so many amazing things we can do with plants, right? <laughs> just a little green infrastructure. Um, and now, Danielle actually mentioned to me, if you look underneath your chair, if you find one of these stickers, you are a lucky recipient of two of the bundles that we have to give away today. So, stormwater management sticker. Take a look, and then if, say, if you will have say, it, these stickers are hard to find because they match the bottom of your chair. Oh, so we got it's one? black and white. Come on up. <laughs> black and white. So if you have the sticker on this side, can you come on up? Yes, I think oh. we have a winner. Awesome. You can come on up come here. On <laughs> so we have a full sun bundle and then prairie? Woodland bundle. All right, let's talk about these plants. <laughs> so these came from my yard. This is called dwarf crested iris. It is a part sun, part shade, uh, prefers dry soils. And when it colonizes, it's a, a ground cover. And in the springtime, it stays about this tall. And in the springtime, it blooms this really pretty violet blue iris shaped flower. This little one, it's called Blephilia ciliata, or horse mint. So it is a mint, but it is a bush-forming mint. It doesn't really spread like the common mints that we are all too familiar with. Um, it's another dry shade species. This is cliff goldenrod, which I think was part of the presentation last week. Um, so you've got a couple of those in there, and then Lastly, one of my favorites, it's called Indian Physic. And so this is about three feet tall in my yard right now. And the bloom, it's a white star-shaped bloom. And, and so they're just finished up and they're now going to seed. Um, so I really like them. They have, you can see they have a very interesting leaf shape. Not your typical thing. I love it. Indian Physic. Yeah, these are all shade, woodland species. And then over here, we've got yarrow, which is most people are pretty familiar with, but it has a fern-like shape, dry, full sun. Uh, this is a white bloom. This little one is a western sunflower. So it's going to get big. It's going to get real tall. And we're looking at 40 inches. Um, but it'll be big sunflower type bloom. And then lastly, we have some grasses, which I, I'm so proud to say that I resurrected. <laughs> they were super crispy. That was and my fault mostly. We, I didn't say that. We, <laughs> we had 300 of them at the office and it was just me trying to keep these guys alive. And that's a whole lot of watering and like keeping them in, in the shade. Just it, stop, it's okay. Daniel did great work. <laughs> Um, but this is little bloom step, little blue stem. So it's a grass, um, and just like the name says, it, it is blue. It has a blue color when it's good and healthy, and it will bush up. It gets about four feet tall, um, and then in the fall, it turns this brown reddish color. It's very pretty, and I like to use it as a backdrop in my landscapes and spread out throughout different landscapes. It's always, and we'll talk more about design later, but. Grasses provide structure for your taller blooming species, so when they, you know, everyone sees them starting to fall over, plant some grasses next to them and they'll help hold them up. Yeah. So that's how we've got. Awesome. Thank you for coming. A round of applause for the winners. Woo! <laughs> awesome. Well, I think we're out of time. So we are out of time, technically, but I will be around for questions. I know Danielle as well. Thank you, everybody, again, for coming out and being here. Um, and we do have another presentation that Danielle is giving next Saturday. Um, so same time, same place. We'll see you here. <laughs> Thank you.